people may realize that <laughs> we have gone through, I don't know, um, eight <laughs> different shows total, including the ones done here in my channel. All of them focusing on replying to Dr. Ortland when it comes to veneration of images, statues, icons. It has been a long journey to reach what I would say is perhaps the end point. Now, there is a show as well where we cover Nicaea II, Hyria, uh, veneration of icons, images. There is that one that we have that we are um, that will air after this one. But this one indeed is probably the most in-depth one as we've already presented positive evidence. We're going to look now at the evidence that Dr. Orland has put forth. Now, we've looked at it briefly before, but as promised, we're going to go through everything, everything. If he thought it was of substance, we're going to give it its value. We're going to reply to it. And uh, hopefully people watch the whole series and hopefully they're edified by the whole series because it really has been my desire for them to be edified and really enjoy. And this particular series on the early church fathers might end up being a two-part series. Can you believe that? Yes. You may be saying, wow, this is just so in-depth. Thank the good Lord it really is. And it likely will be a two-part one. Um, I don't want to go three, four, five hours, but we need to look at everything. And one pretty, and in, every now and then we're going to stop. We'll look at um, what Dr. Ortland has brought up. Uh, we'll look at Munitius Felix. Is there anything here? Now, he brings up a number of early fathers. We're going to have to look at all of them in depth. But there's nothing here. And some of them we have to stop, give a little bit more time to. And then on others, you know, there really is not a whole lot of time to be that, uh, that they need to be given. This one in particular, uh, we're going to give it a little bit of time. Um, so, Minicius, why do they endeavor with such pains to conceal and to cloak whatever they worship? Why have they no altar, no temples, no acknowledge images? Now, he's very clearly talking about the pagans here. That's what he's talking about here. There really is no need to even go into it, uh, because if you are condemning pagans, if you are uh, condemning idolatry, uh, as Catholics, we, uh, we give a hearty amen to that. We do the very same thing. So is it worthwhile to go into Min Minicius Felix uh, when he is not condemning Christians, that are giving a veneration through an image or an icon or a statue, but rather condemning pagan idolatry, we do not think it is worthwhile. It is not a robust quote, and we think that Dr. Wortley knows that as well. But a quote that would look on its face as if it were a robust quote is from the great St. Clement of Alexandria, where he does write, Works of art cannot then be sacred and divine. Now, you can interpret that to being a condemnation. Okay, well, you were condemning uh, idols and icons and statues in the sense that uh, they are divine. Nobody believes they're divine. But then the sacred there is because icons and images and statues are, are, are given a, 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 um, a kind of honor, a kind of respect because... Uh, that respect and that honor goes to the one that is uh, portrayed there. So if if this quote was in context, uh, then it, it definitely would be uh, problematic for us. Uh, but it, it isn't. And as we've seen, St. Clement of Alexandria actually presents a positive case for images. And indeed, the bigger problem, and a problem we have seen over and over from Dr. Orton, we've called it out a number of times, um, we've been called uncharitable for calling it out before, and I don't know why. I wish I wish that kind of rhetoric would be absent, because when you're doing apologetics material, when you're doing apologetics works, um, uh, you're going to have to call out somebody for being wrong or being in error. And if you call them out for um, uh, gross error or massive misrepresentation, and then if you're going to get called mean for that, then well, look, I, I don't know what to say. You're If you're in the field of apologetics and you can't handle criticism then maybe you're in the wrong field then. Maybe you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, because I understand doing scholarly work and then apologetics work and then crossing them over, but then being offended at any little kind of criticism 
Uh, maybe you're in the wrong field and you're doing the wrong thing. If any little criticism bothers you or my better advice would be do better work, do better work. And then you won't get criticized as much as you do, because this is really just ripped out of context. Look at that. I mean, even even this, that I mean, the very fact that you have it just ripped out of context. He's talking clearly, clearly. Let's read it. It were indeed ridiculous, as the philosophers say, for man the plaything of God to make God and for God to be the plaything of art. So he's clearly talking about these pieces, these works of art being made into God, similar to the condemnation found in the book of Exodus, where they, the golden calf is called Yahweh, the one that led them out of the land of bondage, which was clearly idolatry. This condemnation is right along those very same lines. It is not shown in context. Uh, so, look, it's one thing to present a father and say, look, they really uh, seem to lean more towards my side. But present them in context is what we ask. And when you do present them in context, they do no favor for your position. They do none. We've looked at St. Clement of Alexandria before. And he says, if it is necessary for us, while engaged in public business or discharging other avocations in the country and often away from our wives to seal anything for the sake of safety, he, the Logos, allows us a signet for this purpose only. Let our seals be either a dove or a fish. I'm going to have to emphasize that. Really double down and emphasize. Let our seals be either a dove or a fish or a ship scudding before the wind or a musical lyre, which Polycrates used, or a ship's anchor, which Seleucus got engraved as a device. And if there be one fishing, he will remember the apostle. So you, you, will, be, you will call to mind the memory of the apostle. And the children drawn out of the water, biblical events, everything here is very clear that images can be utilized in a religious context. Don't get things mixed up when the um, our evangelical friends say, well, I want to see an example of uh, somebody uh, lighting a candle or prostrating before an image. No. What is the message of Nicaea 2? What is the theology directly from our faith? Is veneration going to the prototype? You can give veneration in a number of ways. In a number of ways, you can venerate someone. Proskuneo, bowing before one, is not the only particular way you can offer up veneration. To offer up duluo, service, religious uh, veneration, can be utilized in many different ways. I think that is a very clear message of scripture, and that is what is not being recognized. I don't want to say that's what's being avoided, but perhaps what is being misunderstood more than anything else. This is why I really thought, and I really do still think, it's very important to understand Catholic theology, to know the very heart and the very message of what it is we're saying. When we get that laid out, it is better and easier understood. But I think that's a massive problem. We have them. A very, very massive one. We move forward. Now we have Tertullian here, who I think it best to not completely avoid every heretic. Now it is an unfortunate thing having to call Tertullian as he is, but he's a heretic. He died outside of the church, died outside of the fold of the church. The likelihood of him ever having returned to the fold is very unlikely. Very unlikely. Likelier that he did die a Montanist. And with that being said, he, the very fact that both of the works that are trotted out from Tertullian are after, one after he's become a full-blown Montanist, just really going after everything uh, uh, church-related, Christian-related within the true church. And the other one, shortly after he became modernist, show that they don't have anything. They don't have anything. Tertullian, as we know, after he becomes a modernist, has very harsh things to say about Holy Mother Mary and has a very poor and a very low Christology. You rarely have ever find any 
Catholics trying to defend Tertullian's Christology or Trinitarian theology post-Montanist. And if you do, there's a problem there. Usually you find you figures like Warfield or others attempting to define every little jot and tittle from Tertullian, when in reality, after he becomes a Montanist, he becomes quite a problematic figure. But he provides a hostile witness for us here, as my dear friend Gary would dub him a hostile witness, because he says that shepherd, the shepherd, will play the patron whom you depict upon your chalice, depict, I say, as himself with all a prostitutor of the Christian sacrament. So he's complaining about the fact that you've got images on sacramental chalices in the church. He will even include, he will even accuse Catholics of being idolaters because they utilize images. Worthily boast the idol of drunkenness and the brides of adultery by which the chalice will quickly be followed. A chalice from which you sip nothing more readily than the flavor of the you of your second repentance. Now, Tertullian also does allow for images in the proper context. He does talk about the bronze serpent in a positive way. And in other areas, he does not include everything as an idol. But he is still a hostile witness. Because when he does attack images, he very clearly provides evidence that the early church utilized them in worship. He calls them idol artificers, are chosen even to the ecclesiastical order of wickedness. The problem with that is how likely is it that you've got somebody worshiping a pagan idol or practicing mass or <laughs> preaching from the pulpit with a with an idol of one of the pagan emperors or a pagan deity that had been condemned. That is not the case. That would not have been the case. There's no evidence of that being the case. If that were, we would have some evidence. Do we have any inkling of it from the one that would uh, succeed him? The great St. Cyprian? No, we don't. Idol artificers, he claims that those within the church are idolaters because of this. He provides for us a negative, a hostile witness to our case. And rather than being a positive testimony for the Protestant position, rather he shows himself to be completely opposed to the Protestant position. Augustine. It is, is it any wonder that Augustine gets trotted out? Um, <clears throat> a lot of Protestants like to adopt Augustine. Now we've dealt with uh, Dr. Ortland and Augustine a lot. In fact, I think that's the very very first dust-ups we had with him. Actually, the first dust-ups or dust-up I had with uh, Dr. Ortland was on Reason and Theology back when, uh, back when I would do shows with, uh, with Mike over there um, over at Reason and Theology. Uh, it was a very different format back then, but we would do roundtables and we had Dr. Ortland on. I think people really wanted to have him on and we had him on and we uh, went back and forth a little bit on um, on Mariology, and I really do. Uh, I think that really is the first time that I uh, I just kind of uh, didn't really think that Dr. Ortland had done a whole lot of work in the field. Now, today, I think he has done much more. He has needed to do much more as he's left the, um, as he's come into the world of apologetics. I want to applaud him for that. He's done more. Hopefully, he will continue doing more and being um being much more responsible with the material. I think he did a very uh, poor uh, job in, in his uh, videos on Augustine. Uh, that was that was just not uh, not very, uh, I didn't think that was very good. But either which way, we've dealt with him on Augustine before. Uh, I think he alluded to him being a scholar on Augustine or something as if that is going to mean that he's right in every little issue when it comes to St. Augustine. Uh, I, I don't know what to say to that, other than the fact that this is taken out of context because this is talking about idolatry again. We, well, if you read the whole context of this exposition, which you can find, by the way, online for free on New Advent, uh, he's clearly talking about idolatry here. But have they mouth and yet speak not? Have the eyes and see not? Do we pray to them? Now, hold on. He, is he talking about Christian artwork? Because through them we pray to God? Now, he's talking about idols in general. So maybe you would have a case to say, well, look, Catholics make a claim that through the images they pray to God. Look, look, look. <laughs> He's not even talking about Christian artwork. He is talking about the fact that pagans make idols and they claim 
that through these idols, they're praying to God. And he goes forward to say, this is the chief cause of this insane profanity. That the figure resembling the living person, look at that, which induces men to worship it. So there's a figure, it resembles a living person, but men are worshiping it. They are not giving uh, honor or veneration to a saint that is represented in the artwork. No, there's a pagan deity that they are giving La True to. They are worshiping. And it has more influence in the minds of these miserable persons than the evident fact that it is not living. So of course it's not living. Do you think Augustine would claim that one of the saints in heaven were not alive? He very clearly believed they were alive. He's talking about pagan idolatry, pagan idols here. And he doesn't have a negative view on images. Because as we looked at before, when dialoguing with Faustus, he says, for Abraham to sacrifice his son of his own accord is shocking madness. His doing so at the command of God proves him faithful and submissive. This is so loudly proclaimed by the very voice of truth that Faustus eagerly rummaging for some fault and reduced at last to slanderous charges has not the boldness to attack this action. And then we get to the good part. Now, uh, what is the point of bringing this up? Uh about Faustus. What is the point? Well, the point is very clear. He doesn't think Faustus would have ever forgotten about this event. Now, how can he have said that? It is not possible he would have forgotten a deed so famous. How do we know that? That it recurs to the mind of itself without any study or reflection and is in fact repeated by so many tongues and pictured. The Latin is very clear. Pictured, portrayed in so many places that no one could pretend to shut his eyes or ears to it. He had no problem with images, with biblical holy images. He had no issue with them. Now, to claim that he did have an issue with them would be incorrect. Would be completely incorrect. And we know that is the case. Basil the Great. Why do we bring up Basil? Now, why do we bring up St. Basil the Great? I, I have to emphasize, we bring him up for a very clear reason. Uh, number one, we bring him up because he is an incredible, he provides incredible testimony. Now, he provides incredible testimony because we hear of that famous letter of his where he talks about uh, the, the honor you give to the image goes to the prototype. But then there is letter 360 frequently used in a letter that is accused of being pseudonymous. We're not going to use it because those that oppose images will hearken to it and claim, well, you don't have anything from the great Basil other than a pseudonymous work. You don't have anything, we're told. But when you do actually survey the writings of St. Basil, we don't have to use anything contested to show his particular position on icons and images. And he did write. When often both historians and painters express manly deeds of war, the one embellishing them with words, the other engraving them onto tablets, they both arouse many two to bravery. The facts which the historical account presents by being listened to, the painting silently portrays by imitation. In this very way, let us to remind those present of the 40 martyrs virtue. So he wants to, he wants an image portrayed to remind people to call to mind their virtue, that is giving them honor. And don't tell me where's the example of him bowing down and lighting the candle. There are many ways of giving honor. There are many ways of veneration. If you are calling to mind the holy virtue of those crowned in glory in heaven, you are giving them honor. I don't want to hear, well, where's the example of him lighting a candle or kissing the image? Let us stick to the strict theology of Nicaea too, as our interlocutors want us to. And this is honor being given to them. And as it were, by bringing their deeds to their gaze, let us motivate them to imitate those who are nobler and closer to them with respect to their course of life. I think when we understand the definitions at hand, we have a better grasp of what we were dialoguing about and talking about. 
And the reason I had to toss St. Vaseline is because we get accused of utilizing a quote in the catechism that really has nothing to do with our theology, but it has everything to do with it. It does. It does have everything to do with it, and it's in context. And this one as well, we don't need to use that letter that is contested to try to make our point about what St. Basil the Great believed. We don't need to. But we continue, which is the very fun part. We get to continue with our Arnobius. What then? And I mean, really, uh, should I even be spending time on this one? But I people requested and they said, William, please do a deep dive. Everything he, Dr. Orland has, uh, brings up, uh, please do a deep dive. And so we're going to do a deep dive. Even though a lot of these quotes really are self-refuting. Really? What then? Without these, do the gods not know that they are worshipped? We don't have gods. What greater wrong, disgrace, hardship can be inflicted than to acknowledge one god, yet make supplication to something else? Okay. Well, they recognize one god, and yet they worship another. To hope for help from a deity, and to pray to an image without feeling. They go together. So they're, they, they have hope for, from a god. And yet they are praying to an idol. They're worshiping this. Um, I don't know what to say. The context is clear. It's self-refuting. But Arnobius doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, beat around the bush. What is the context? Your gods, then, dwell in plaster and terracotta? I mean, really, this, this is self-refuting. Since in the course of the exposition, it has been shown sufficiently how futile it is to make images we must not speak of sacrifice he's talking about idols the images arnobius speaks of are idols he says your gods these are gods of twill and plaster he concludes that it is futile to make these idols this really is clear he's not completely against images but in context context doesn't always help Dr. Orton. In fact, we're going to find that context at times really seems to not matter to Dr. Orton. And that really is our main major, major problem, our main issue with Dr. Orton's work. And it is a problematic one. Being taught in the school of Jesus Christ, have rejected all images and statues. There's nothing else to be read here. It's over, man. We're taught in the school of Christ. And we reject all images and statues. Now, origin of Alexandria is not an early church father. <laughs> I know people. what people are going to say. Well, William, how convenient. You'll quote origin when it's convenient to you. And when it is not convenient, you just brush him to the side. That is not what we're doing today. We're not doing that. I'm going to deal with origin. We recognize Origen is not an early church father, but he's a great, a great ecclesiastical writer. We still uh, uh, study and, and um, uh, delve into and devour his works, even new ones that are being discovered. In fact, we have some new translations of a new uh, set of works discovered of his in our book on transubstantiation. I think the only place we can find that translation so far is in our book on transubstantiation and even in our book on Mary, which uh, the translation is done by the Reverend Dr. Coppins. But <clears throat> we continue and we delve in. Being taught in the school of Jesus Christ, they've re we've rejected all images and statues. If you're part of the school of Christ, you reject all images and statues. This is weird. Because that's not even a, a, a complete sentence. I, I at, at times, I, 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 I'm baffled by... Dr. Ortland's presentations. Now, why do I tell you, the audience, that at times I'm baffled? Well, I've pointed out a number of issues before with Dr. Ortland's work, uh, from utilizing uh, anti-Christian Mormon websites and uh, really just really not liking the fact that I call him out on that, to misusing and abusing scholarship, to, <clears throat> to doing this here. You know, presenting it as that that's pretty much, uh, you know, it's a sentence and, you know, it's, it isn't. Look at the context. He's very clearly talking about pagan idolatry. And look at the context. Not wholly blinded, yet they are in error in many matters of belief. But whether Orpheus, Parmenides, 
and Empedocles, or even Homer himself, and Hesiod, are the persons whom he means by inspired poets. Let anyone show how those who follow their guidance walk in a better way or lead a more excellent life than those who, being taught in the school of Jesus Christ, have rejected all images and statues and even all Jewish superstition. Now, in that context, we can give a hearty amen. But then Dr. Ortland might come back and say, well, they've rejected all images and statues. Not only idols, but that is the context, Dr. Ortland. But he might say, well, William, I, you know, even that one sentence I put, even though it wasn't a complete sentence there because it, it goes on. Yeah, he just put a little, uh, little bit there. He goes on. He didn't put the whole context. Do I think he deliberately did it to be dishonest? Uh, you know, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't. I think maybe he might have gotten the quote online and just copied and pasted it. I don't think he would have deliberately tried to be dishonest. I don't think he's uh, a, a try. He tries to do things to be a liar and to be dishonest. <clears throat> do I think he tries to uh, skew the information? I think he tries to um, make it look like the early church was not as Catholic as it was. Because that would do his Protestant position a greater service. I think he does try to do that. And I think in the end, every video of his that we've examined, uh, we have exposed it. I don't think any of them have been particularly compelling. And I think that is why people get mad in the comment section. Uh, to be clear, I think I've had uh, almost a thousand comments. And out of the almost a thousand, I think I've had maybe one Catholic think that I was uncharitable. Can you believe that? Maybe like one. All the others have been happy that uh, the misleading material has been put out. I think you had one Catholic saying, oh, well, how mean of you. Well, if you think I'm being mean by exposing information that I think is trying to mislead the flock, uh, then I, I, I guess I, I don't know what to tell you there. <laughs> I don't know what to say there. Uh, I frequently get accused of being mean when I respond to Dr. Ortland. Uh, guess what? I've been debating people from the leading Protestant ministry in Alpha and Omega for almost 20 years. I've debated the leading Islamic apologist, the leading atheist apologist, and on and on. And I've never had any of them ever, ever claim William was mean. Yeah, William was uncharitable. Yeah, I don't want to debate or talk to that guy again. I've debated him over and over and over and over again. And in fact, I've got multiple more debates in 2023 with top Islamic scholars and top atheist scholars where I'm going to be debating them for some of them for the eighth time. If you're in the world of apologetics in this field, get ready to get criticized. And rightly so, because this is misleading. <clears throat> Anybody can go to the Patologia and look up the actual Greek of origin. And realize that if we examine the actual Greek text from origin, contracelsus, it is actually origin's condemnation against pagan shrines and statues. There truly is no condemnation against biblical statues and or iconography. As we can see, this particular Greek word employed by origin highlights the point that he was attempting to make. He is not condemning images. He's condemning pagan shrines and condemning pagan statues. They go hand in hand. That does make it make a whole lot more sense. Why does he throw all images in there? I understand why the translator did that. Because he probably figured shrines and statues seems a bit repetitive. According to the Greek word, it, it may be a little bit repetitive because... This particular Greek word is utilized for statue in other areas. But it's also used for shrine, particularly in the great Greek texts, as Henry George Liddell and Robert Scott point out in the Greek and English lexicon, and I found many others as well. So instead of repeating statues and statues, he put images, but it very clearly is the Greek should be the Greek word, and there are other translations that recognize that, other scholars that recognize that. 
It is pagan shrines being referenced and pagan statues. That is the context of what Origen is condemning. We don't have pagan shrines or statues in the Christian world, he says. <clears throat> that is his message. We go back. Being taught in the school of Jesus Christ had rejected all images and statues. I just wish the context would have been shown. Now, of course, Dr. Ortland might come back and say, well, I, I referenced where you could find it. You could have gone yourself. Yeah, Dr. Orland, but how many people are going to do that? Rather, many people are going to look and they're going to read where it says, being taught in the school of Jesus Christ, have rejected all images and statues, and they're going to think that is a complete sentence in. But as my friend Swan pointed out, that's just really odd that he did that. <clears throat> if we are honest with the material... And we approach the material in an honest manner, then we have we should have no problem being able to defend our case and defend our faith. Did you catch that again? <clears throat> if we present the material properly, and if our faith cannot shine through, the problem is with our faith. That's very clear. There's more origin. It is in consideration of these and many other such commands that Christians not only avoid temples, altars, and images, but are ready to suffer death when it is necessary, rather than debased by any such impiety and piety, the conception which they have of the Most High God. Now, number one, it would be ludicrous to ever assume that Christians don't have altars. Really? Many times, Origen references that we do. He believes in the Holy Eucharist. He's a great defender of uh, of the Eucharist, and you're going to see. Believe the Eucharist is a sacrifice. Um, are we going to then read this and say, "Well, well, all Christians avoid all temples, all altars, all images"? No, we would then realize he's talking about pagan temples, altars, and images. Mm. Very clearly through the context, right? That is clear. But even at that, even at that, he's not condemning all images here. Because if we look at the actual Greek text, well, does the text actually talk of it about images that are being avoided? It doesn't. It actually employs the Greek word boimoi. And this is a type of altar, particularly a pagan altar, as referenced in Acts 17. Yes, you can go to the pathologia of this exact work quoted by Dr. Ortland, and you can find that it isn't even talking about images. It isn't even talking about images. It is condemning pagan altars. Now, were there images <clears throat> at the pagan altar which led the translator to then translate it that way? Probably. But that particular Greek word is about a pagan altar, as referenced in Acts 17. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Exact Greek word right here. This is the pagan altar. This is a pagan altar as referenced by St. Paul when he was in the Areopagus passing by an altar to an unknown God. We have got to recognize that context is everything. It is everything. Lactantius, and there's a lot more, by the way. You, you're wondering, well, William, you are doing an incredibly deep dive. You, ha I have to. I have to, and hopefully these videos will be of great service to you in the future. In case you ever need to go back and look at them. Uh, that, that really is my hope. Lactantius. If a statue, the resemblance of man is made by the exercise of design and art, shall we suppose that man himself is made up of fragments which come together at random? So if, if we look at like Tantius, you can look at his condemnation of images, pagan idolatry, and then you look at the fact that he never ever talks about Christian artwork. Um, he never talks about Christian artwork in the worship context, in the sense of, you know, in churches, but he does talk about artwork in a positive way when he says, 
for the plan of making likenesses was invented by men for this reason that it might be possible to retain the memory of those who had either been removed by death or separated by an absence. We've looked at Elvira before. We did a whole show on Elvira, remember? Mm -hmm. We'll briefly look at it again. Uh, <clears throat> we'll briefly look at Elvira again, because remember what Gavin Ortlin had to say. Mm. Share sound. Yeah. We've gotten to Canon 36 of the Synod of Elvira yet, early 4th century, says pictures are not to be placed in churches. So they do not become objects of worship and adoration. It's like, okay, that seems pretty clear, right? But people will try to find all these ways to get around this. Now, number one, I, I recognize that there are a number of different translations on that particular canon. And even, I've even dialogued with scholars that say, it is not a devastating canon, even if it were a legitimate one, that it is mistranslated. But I, I'm not going to focus on whether or not it's mistranslated. I'm going to focus on the fact that it is heavily contested. There are many scholars that do not believe it to be legitimate. Bishops that were present there were not anti-icon. Actually, bishops in the region, <laughs> the region there were very pro-image bishops. <laughs> and indeed, uh, not only that, but later Spanish councils that adopt Elvira, canons of Elvira, you don't ever hear of that one. In my opinion, it's a very clearly spurious canon. And the very important point is, even if Ortland comes back and says, well, William, you're not a scholar in Elvira. No, I may not be, but I do know that it's heavily contested. And if you don't want us to be using texts that are considered pseudonymous or heavily contested, you should eliminate things like Elvira as well from your work. But remember, Canon 36 forbids religious art inside churches. We already read what it says. But as I pointed out before, many believe it. Elvira is riddled with pseudo-canons. Many believe only the first 20-some are legitimately from Elvira. And that would mean that Canon 36, which is the one about images and artwork, would be a... Pseudo canon. Dr. Leva, Dr. Leva, noted that many believe only the first few are legitimate. We know this. And in the interview I've had with Dr. Leva, and guess what? I just did two more interviews. Two of them are in German. I hope to get those out soon. I did two more, two in German, with more. And in those German ones, we've got multiple scholars that list a bunch of guys. A bunch of scholars, Latin, French, and German, I didn't know there were Latin ones, uh, that uh, that argue that this is just a problematic council in terms of just two, tons of pseudo-canons. Some believe this clearly to be a late forgery. So uh, th this does no favor to the Protestant position when you realize Canon 36 very clearly is a pseudo-canon. That's a problem. I remember when I did these slides, I wrote their numerous Spanish and German scholars. I'm going to add, there's more, there's French, and there's also uh, Italian scholars, I'm sorry, those that have written in, uh, in Italian. I don't want to stumble on my words, because if I make any little tiny, any little tiny mistake, <laughs> people that are uh, so much, so opposed to my work will come on and say, oh, look, you know, William... He confused Dr. Ortland and Cameron Bertuzzi, and they'll just park the bus in that rather than dealing with any of the refutations. <laughs> you remember when that was done? Rather than dealing with the bulk of my refutations, oh, look, how could he have confused Cameron and Gavin? He got them wrong. It was Cameron that said this. Oh, goodness, the whole presentation just goes out the window now. We want to kind of avoid that now so that we don't give them any, any wiggle room of escaping from this. Now we arrive at Saint Epiphanius. Let's pause for a moment. Our very next section very likely is going to become a whole show on its own. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry because I'm going to get you a little bit teased up on it with only a little piece here and I'm going to leave you hanging. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to because there's a lot to present. I mean, we've still got a number of fathers. Uh, uh, Eusebius is not a church father, but a, uh, a church writer. Uh, St. Epiphanius, Pope St. Gregory the Great. We, we've got a lot to dig into. 
So we're going to have to do a whole show just probably in Epiph Epiphanius and Eusebius. <clears throat> and there's not enough time because I don't want you to get bored, whether whatever it is you're doing. I want to keep these shows to about an hour, an hour and a half. So we're, we're going to hear what Dr. Ortlin has to say. We'll read a little bit about uh, Epiphanius, and then we're going to have to leave you hanging for the next part. But hey, there's a way that you can watch the next part right now without having to wait. If you're a patron, you have access to everything immediately. Now, I know people may be saying, William, I barely have enough money to get me a burrito at the at the, uh at the mini mart, what are you talking about? I'm a patron. Don't worry, it will air in a few days. I'm only going to leave you hanging for about two days. But there's a way you can support me if you like this work. Like, share, subscribe, and down below, do me even if you're a patron watching this, do me a huge favor. Please leave your thoughts and your comments down below. The algorithm will be helped massively if you comment and you share. Go above and beyond by sharing. Please do that. Let us hear what Dr. Ortland has to say about St. Epiphanius. For example, in the late 4th century, Epiphanius, Bishop of Salamis, relates this incident in a letter to John, the Bishop of Jerusalem. I came to a villa called Anablatha. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Don't know where it is. It's somewhere near Jerusalem. And as I was passing, I saw a lamp burning there. Asking what place it was and learning it to be a church, I went in to pray and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose image it was. Seeing this, and being loth that an image of a man, loathe, we would say today, uh, I think that's how we pronounce that, uh, loathe, as in hesitant, or against, that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor person. He goes on for a bit and he's basically saying that he took it away. So he's explaining he sent a new curtain to John to replace the one that he destroyed. And then he makes this request to John, I beg that you will order the presbyter of the place to take the curtain which I have sent from the hands of the reader and that you will afterward give directions that curtains of the other sort opposed as they are to our religion, shall not be hung up in any church of Christ. A man of your uprightness should be careful to remove an occasion of offense, unworthy alike of the church of Christ and of those Christians who are committed to your charge. So he's saying the, this usage of images in the church is against the teaching of scriptures, it's against our religion. What's interesting is he doesn't seem to think that this needs to be argued. Now, I want to pause for a moment here because the very statements that, uh, that Dr. Ortlund is going to make are ones that baffle me. Now, you're going to realize why they baffle me in a moment. Number one, this is a very problematic text of St. Epiphanius. Very problematic. Uh, the fathers thought it was a fake. They thought it was fraudulent. Now, they didn't care about the Eusebian one, but they did about this one, and they thought it was a fake. And there are a number of problems with it. My main issue with Dr. Ortland's presentation here is he doesn't give any indication that this is a very very contested work for his relationship with john is strained at this point but he doesn't seem to be anticipating that there could be resistance to this it's just kind of he's just kind of assuming this is what we do this is what christians do this is the this is unworthy of the church of christ to have those there okay um now there's a bunch of other passages from epiphanius where he has a similar view but they're sometimes disputed so uh th this really is <laughs> this really does baffle me because if you notice what Dr. Ortland's doing here, he's pretty much like, ah, you know, there's a lot more in Epiphanius. It is disputed. I'm not going to deal with the texts that are disputed. I'm going to deal with the one that really, you know, it isn't disputed. Now, what are you Catholics going to do about that one? Rather than get into that, I'm not going to go into those. I deal with that more in the book. I want to rewind that. I want to rewind that because I'm not going to accuse Dr. Ortland of being dishonest. I think it'd be better to accuse him of really not knowing any better than to accuse them of being dishonest. Christians who are committed to your charge. So he's saying the, this usage of images in the church is against the teaching of scriptures, it's against our religion. What's interesting is he doesn't seem to think that this needs to be argued for. He's putting a lot, a lot of stock into this from St. Epiphanius. His relationship with John is strained at this point, but he doesn't seem to be anticipating that there could be resistance to this. It's just kind of, he's just kind of assuming this is what we do. This is what Christians do. This is now, here's where he's going to make the statement. This is unworthy of the Church of Christ to have those there. Okay. Um, 
Now there's a bunch of other passages from Epiphanius where he has a similar view, but they're sometimes disputed. So rather than get into that, I'm not going to go into those. I deal with that more in the book. No, th this is heavily disputed, Dr. Ortland. And to me, I find it incredibly problematic that you will present the text and you will imply rather directly say, well, there's others that are disputed. Uh, you know, they're contested. I'm not going to deal with those. Yeah, I'm going to deal with one that really, really is not contested. Even though he doesn't flat out say it, that is what is directly being implied here. If you're not going to deal with the ones that are contested and problematic, well, what does that mean you're dealing with here? He flat out says, well, there's others with the same view. Those are contested. I'm not going to deal with those. But Dr. Ortland, this one is, this is problematic. This one is heavily contested, Dr. Ortland. There are a number of problems with the iconophobic text of St. Epiphanius. Number one, we recognize many modern-day scholars do accept them. They believe them they're authentic. But we're going to deal with the ones that believe they're authentic, and I'm also going to show that there's many that don't. Because I heard the flip side argument, oh, well, William, you know, modern-day scholars that know better. Number one, modern-day scholars don't know better than the early church fathers that lived at that time. Or those that would have known about the authentic works of the fathers that had been handed down through the centuries. Don't give me that garbage that modern-day scholarship is the idol on your table that you light candles to. And that is the end-all. I don't care about modern-day scholarship. Show me the evidence, and we will judge by the evidence. Modern-day scholars also attack all kinds of things of the Bible and the Fathers. So this is a problem. The great St. John of Damascus, the great St. Theodore the Studite, St. Nicophorus, condemn the text as fakes. It's fake. And they laid out a fantastic case we'll later look at for denying the authenticity of the letter. We will examine some of the fantastic points that the fathers made against these so-called Epiphanian texts. And I want to say texts rather than letters, texts. But let us far summarize our evidence on iconoclastic evidence versus evidence in favor of the veneration. The text, as we've seen thus far, and we're going to see even more later, against the usage of images in worship are either heavily contested, don't appear in any writings of the particular father for many centuries after their death, have different writing style, were heavily contested in Nicaea too, or never even utilized like Elvira. For our presentation of the positive case, we're not utilizing any contested or spurious texts, such as letter 360 of St. Basil, which has not been entered as evidence. What about the text of St. Epiphanius? Are the authentic? And if modern-day scholars believe they are, what about the modern-day ones that don't believe they are? But even better, what about the fathers at that time of the controversy that made their case against them being authentic? And if we compare them to the authentic, the ones that are not contested texts of St. Epiphanius, are they similar? The next show will be all about St. Epiphanius. Then the one after that will be Eusebius and then Pope St. Gregory the Great. Now you may have thought, well, you know, we're reaching the end line. I'm really liking this, William. I don't want it to end. Don't worry. It's not going to end anytime soon. And before it all ends, there will be a debate on the issue of icons and images and veneration. God bless you.